Uh, actually, that brings us to a brand new series that we're doing right now, and it's a very different series from what I planned. Actually, if we go back a couple of months ago, I had something else in mind. I'm always like six to 12 months out, and I had a completely different idea for what I would do coming out of the week of prayer and fasting. But our world has taken a different direction uh, for the most part of the last couple of years, and especially over these past few months, where many, many people I talk to, their greatest concern is the state of the economy and the impact it has on our lives. Maybe actually you don't care about the economy, but you definitely care about the impact it has on your life. And you may not understand all of the national numbers, but when your groceries cost more and when you suddenly aren't sure if you can pay your bills and when all of the changes affect a layoff or something, we get concerned. And matter of fact, this is somewhat anecdotal because I didn't count, but when I go on my app in the mornings and I read the news, it sure seems to me like every other article is about the state of the economy, the concerns people have, the advice people try to give. You know, it's, it's all about some bad news. And then there are these cards. The final reason that I decided to change what we were going to talk about coming out of the week of prayer and fasting was that every time we do this, anywhere from 25 to 50% of these cards are saying, I need God to touch my finances. I, I need I need some help. I, I need even a miracle. I need God to do something there. Matter of fact, I want to share a card with you. Uh, this is one of the cards that was given this week. I don't know who this person is, but their prayer request is they pray that I could find a job that allowed me to provide for my family instead of being a complete failure at life. And that's the point. When, when we're struggling financially, it hits more than our wallet. It hits all of our life. It can hit how we feel about ourselves. It can hit our marriages. It can hit our relationship with God because we're the ones going to God and saying, God, I need your help. I need a job or I need this thing. And so what we want to do is see if we can bring some solutions to some of the problems that we're facing. We thought if this is one of the biggest topics we're facing today, it's probably something that we should talk about. And the good news is there is a solution, I think, for many of the things, if not everything we face. Matter of fact, if I could give you a picture. Imagine that you were to go to the doctor because your knees hurt. And, and they're, they're hurting so much that you're at a point where you're not even able to climb the stairs. And so the doctor looks at you and thinks, I have an idea. You look pretty fit. Can, can I take a measurement on your heart? Can I check your blood pressure and some things? So he checks your blood pressure, checks your pulse. And he says, you know what? Your heart is in as good a condition as I could ask for someone in your shape and your physical condition from what I can tell on the outside looks like you are very fit and healthy. So let me ask you a question. Are you a runner? And you say, what? Well, yes, doctor, how did you know? Well, when your heart's in great shape and your body's in great shape and your knees are trash, <laughs> it means that you run a lot. Like, I mean, it's just, you're putting them through something. He said, so here's the problem. If you wanna keep running, I've got a solution. All you've gotta do is get a bike. And if you start riding your bike, you can keep the endurance, you can keep the strength training, you can keep the cardio, but it takes the pressure off of your knees. You see, just like a simple solution with a doctor, so often they can look and go, I know what's wrong, and I know how to fix it. The same is true of our finances. Maybe we don't always know the answers, but I know someone who does, his name is Jesus. So what we're going to do, as you can tell from the screen behind me here, is we've taken the Jesus Said series idea because we got so much great feedback on it because everybody loves Jesus. And he said some challenging things that made us grow. We're gonna take what Jesus said about money and see if we can find some financial peace and a lot less worry about what we face in our lives. Are you guys ready for this? Okay, so what we're gonna do today, if you've got your Bibles, you can turn with me to Luke chapter 12. That's gonna be our main passage. And as we start today looking at what Jesus said, his statement today that we want to address is not something you would actually think is all that related to money. But Jesus helps us understand that actually this is one of the causes of many of our money problems. So we're in Luke chapter 12, verse 15, and here's what he says. He says, take care and be on your guard against all covetousness. Co covetousness, covetousness. I had to practice saying that word to preach this message this week. Four syllables of a word we don't say very often. Covetousness, covetousness. You say it 10 times fast, I promise you won't get them all right, right? Now, here's the thing. If you actually did open your paper Bible or pull up on your phone, on your app, you may have gotten that English version. 
There's really two ways that all of our English versions say it, and they're both fine, they're both great, they're both biblical, they use synonyms, slightly different words. And the reason that I want to talk about that is because this is the way my version that I normally read would say it. And when I hear that, I, I read that and go, eh, I'm okay, I'm good, let's move on, Jesus. Matter of fact, I think a lot of people would say the same thing. And first of all, it starts with take care. We're here in the South. We're so used to somebody driving away after they've come to visit, and we say, take care, y'all. Y'all have a good time now. Don't run in a ditch. Y'all just take care. Be good. That's kind of how those words play in our minds. And so we don't think it's really all of that big of a deal. Just take care, y'all. And then we move on over to this covetous, covetousness, covetousness word. Okay, most of us have no idea what that truly means. We have little, eh, maybe, but we would not want to get up on stage and actually try to define it for everybody. Matter of fact, point, I had someone this week say, Jimmy, what are you preaching on? I said, I'm going to preach on take care, be on your guard against all covetousness. And they came to me after the first service and said, did you change what you were preaching on? Because what came to their mind earlier this week when I said that was absolutely nothing to do with what I actually did preach today. Most of us, we just don't grasp that word. So I'm going to tell you what comes to my mind, because I grew up going to church, I grew up going to Sunday school, and uh, since I don't use the word covetousness, and you probably don't either, but I do remember the word covet, the first two syllables of that. And so what comes to my mind is one of the Ten Commandments that I learned in church, right? I'm going to share it with you, because most of us, this is probably the only thought we have when we hear that word, where one of the Ten Commandments tells us, you shall not covet, right? You've heard that before. You shall not covet your neighbor's house, you shall not covet your neighbor's wife or his male servant or his female servant or his ox or his donkey or anything that is your neighbor's. And I'm going to tell you the truth. When I was a kid, I thought, I'm good because I don't have much stuff anyway. So, you know, I'm not really worried about it. It's all my dad. My dad's got to have all this stuff. And now that I become an adult, I read this and that comes to mind. And I think I'm still good because my neighbor ain't got no donkey. I'm not worried about his donkey. I'm not trying to compete with his donkey. My neighbor ain't got no servants. I'm not worried about his servants. My neighbor's house, well, he lives right beside me in the same neighborhood. So his house is kind of just like mine. It's not all that special. And truth be told, I'm the one that just finished a renovation, so he's probably coveting mine, if we could just be straight for the record. And as far as his wife goes, well, she's a very sweet, nice lady, and she weighs in the driveway, but I like my wife a whole lot better. So I'm totally good, Jesus. Let's just move on. And that's how we read that verse. And then somebody says, well, you know, Jimmy, your neighbor is not just like the one who lives beside you. It's like everybody else. Oh, okay, so now I got a new problem. I have to worry about coworkers who drive up in a brand new car. Let's say Kent gets a brand new car. And, and I can still say, I'm good. I don't covet his car. I say, God, I don't want Kent's car. I just want one like it. Can you give that to me? I don't have a problem coveting God, you know? And so most of us would read when Jesus says, take care, be on your guard against all covetousness, and, and we would just move on. So let me show you what the other English versions say. Again, it's just being translated with English synonyms, and so all the versions are biblical and good, but this has words that we might relate to a little bit better. So Jesus said, beware. That's a little bit stronger than take care, y'all. Kind of gets your attention. You see, when we hear the take care, we kind of think of a sign that says, mind your step when there's only one step because you might like trip and scrape your knee. But when Jesus goes, beware, that's like a mind your step sign on the edge of the Grand Canyon. Like, you know, I'm going to scrape a knee. This is a life-threatening situation. You better watch out. Okay, Jesus, we better watch out for what? Beware, guard against every kind of greed. Now, we're, we can relate to that word a little bit better than covetousness, but you want to know the truth? I bet if I went around and asked most of you, I'd say, I, I don't have a greed problem. Because our idea of greed, we get images in our mind of like when we went to kindergarten and, and when it was cookie time after recess and you got to go up and get a cookie and go back to your seat. And, and then one kid, he was about the fifth kid in line, he walks up there, he stops for a minute, looks back at everybody, and he grabs as many cookies as he can fit in his hands and he runs. And the teacher's like, no, 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 no. You put those back. Don't be. And our idea of greedy is we're stealing cookies from kids. Or, or we're, we want money so bad we're sneaking it out of somebody's purse in front of us in church. Like, I'm not stealing. I'm not grabbing all the cookies. I let everybody have a fair share. I don't have a greed problem. Well, let's take a look at what Jesus was actually saying. 
I want to give you a definition for the word that the Bible uses. Not the English word. This is not a Webster's Dictionary definition. This is the definition of the word that was used in the original language 2,000 years ago. And so I want you to know what Jesus was thinking. When he used this word greed, which can be greed or covetousness, the original word means this. It is a strong desire to acquire more and more, and maybe we could add, and more material possessions. And to have more than other people, regardless of need. I got a cookie, you got a cookie, I got to have another cookie. You, you have a donkey, I got to have two donkeys. I mean, it, it's just something in us that says we've just got to have more. That's what Jesus is talking about. And if you would say, Jimmy, I don't have a problem with that. I, I mean, like, I don't go around like having more and more and more stuff. I'd say, well, let's just think about that for a second. You see, I travel and work in third world countries, and I've got friends that are pastoring churches there. And, and I, have, I have to tell you, I just, I, I'm just blown away when I see the way that they have a smile on their face when they have so little stuff sometimes. And honestly, I'm embarrassed to tell them about our way of life. And, and I had one time I was talking with one of the, the pastors in one of these countries, a friend of mine, and we were talking about an industry we have. We have an industry here in our culture that they've never heard of. And it's called storage units. You see, here's the proof that we have a problem with more and more and wanting more is that your car probably is not parked in your garage, the room for the car, because your garage is so filled with more stuff, right? And, and you can't even fit anything in your house because you've already got the vacuum seal bags. You put all your clothes in them, and you, then you shrink it down, and you slide it under the bed. You can't fit anything under your bed. You can't fit anything in the closet. You can't fit anything in the garage. You have to rent a closet across town at a storage facility so I think we can all agree, we might have a problem with wanting more and more stuff, which is why Jesus finished it with saying, life is not measured by how much you own. Beware, guard against every kind of greed. Life is not measured by how much you own. What he's trying to say is if greed gets in your heart, you're going to want stuff, you're going to chase stuff, you're going to get stuff, but then the real problem is this, you're gonna measure success and happiness by how much stuff you have and you are very likely to miss out on the real point of life. I wanna show you what Jesus was actually talking about. I think when you read the Bible and you study, it is so important to know what is the context. Sometimes we just read verses, we take them out of context, and we miss so much because we don't know what was going on. The truth is at this point, Jesus had not been talking about stuff. He had not been talking about money. He had been talking about something else, and he had to change his direction. Let's go back just a few sentences. Here's what Jesus was saying. But anyone who denies me here on earth will be denied before God's angels. And when you are brought to trial in the synagogue and before rulers and authorities, don't worry about how to defend yourself. Jesus is talking about like some of the deepest spiritual matters. He's talking about things that affect eternity. He's saying, look, you're gonna wanna make sure you acknowledge me on earth so that I acknowledge you when you get to heaven. That's gonna be really important. And by the way, if you do acknowledge me here on earth, you're gonna get arrested, you're gonna get tried, you're gonna get put in prison, you might even get killed. So it's not gonna go well for you if you do identify with me here on earth, but don't worry, because the Holy Spirit will be with you. But hey, this is serious stuff. Then someone called from the crowd, teacher, please tell my brother to divide our father's estate with me. I think there are verses missing from the Bible right here. I'm pretty sure Jesus' next words, which were not recorded, were, are you kidding me? Dude, the Son of God is standing in front of you, talking to you about eternal matters, like making sure you know how to get to heaven and you don't miss something important along the way and the fact that your whole life could be like prosecuted and killed. I mean, like, this is serious stuff and all you are worried about is whether or not you get half of your daddy's donkeys. Your brother's getting all the donkeys. You don't get any donkeys and you're all worried about who gets all the donkeys. That verse is missing from my Bible. By the way, I entitled today's message, Beware the Donkeys, just for the fun of it. So, if you've heard the 
statistic that Jesus talked more about money and material things than he did heaven, hell, or prayer. That's actually true, at least in what we have recorded. And the reason I think for that is because as he tried to talk about some of these deep spiritual matters, it was overwhelmingly apparent time and time again that what truly gripped the hearts of humanity was greed, money, materialism, and these things. So he changes his subject, and he says, beware, be on your guard against all covetous. Life does not matter with what you have. That's not what makes up life. And so he says, let me tell you a story. Let's keep going. A rich man had a fertile farm that produced fine crops. That means he had a lot of stuff. He said to himself, what shall I do? I don't have room for all my stuff. Then he said, I know, I'll tear down my barns and I'll build bigger ones. Then I'll have room enough to store all my stuff. And I will sit back and say to myself, my friend, we already know the guy's got problems. He talks to himself in third person. But anyway, my friend, you have enough stored away for years to come. Now take it easy, eat, drink, and be merry. He's feeling all good about all his stuff. But God said to him, you fool. You will die this very night. Then who will get what you have worked for? So what do we need to do? Well, that's the easy question. Guard against every kind of greed. Does anybody want to end up like this guy in the story? Does anybody want to be this guy in the story? I didn't think so. So we need to do what Jesus said, which is guard against every kind of greed. And well, the truth is, the only question we really have is how? Because we already know Jesus told us what to do. How do we actually guard against every kind of greed? Well, we're going to have to start by actually acknowledging the world we live in. We live in a greedy world. I did not give many amens. Are y'all not with me? Have y'all looked outside your windows lately? We live in a very greedy world. And I'm not trying to pick on anybody. I'm not trying to insult culture around me. And I am definitely not trying to get people send me mean emails or attack me on Instagram. It's just the truth. And, and I'm gonna prove it to you because see, we live in a world that constantly says you need more no matter what you have. For instance, has anyone ever seen a commercial that says this is our brand new product, but you don't need it? <laughs> Have you ever seen the commercial that says, it's only $19.95, but that's still a waste of your money. Don't bother. Have you ever seen the commercial that says, and here's our brand new phone you've been waiting a whole year for, but it does exactly what your old phone does, so don't rush down to the Verizon store anytime soon. Anyone ever seen that? No, no, no. Our world is constantly saying, you need more and more and more. What you have is not enough. What you have is not good enough. You need newer, you need better, you need more, you need more, you need more. So we've got to start with just acknowledging God is asking us to live in a way that's very difficult in this world because this world is constantly bombarding us with Jesus's definition of greed. The world around us is constantly doing it. If we can't at least acknowledge what we live in, we're in trouble, right? So what do we need to do to guard against greed? Well, some of you may push back. Jimmy, I, I, I don't have a problem with this. I say, okay. It's possible you have been working on this with Jesus for a very long time. Possible. Or you're simply not human. Because here's what the Bible says about normal humans. The eyes of man are never satisfied. Never satisfied. We never have enough. No matter what we have, we're always looking and going, ooh, I need more. I mean, we're the kind of people like we go out to a beautiful meal. We enjoy every minute of it. Great dinner out with your wife or your husband. And halfway home, even though you just went to this great restaurant, you see a sign for an ice cream shop. Yeah, and you have to go. It was just not enough. Like, oh, that, that's my favorite ice cream. Well, we had creme brulee on it. Yes, but not ice cream, you know? When we go to a mall, for all the young people, that's like Amazon, but you actually have to use your feet when you go to it. <laughs> and no truck drops it off on your porch. So what happens is everything you buy, you have to carry back to your car. And y'all know what happens. You start buying stuff and it gets heavier and heavier to a point you've got little white lines across your fingers right here. And these fingertips are turning purple. And even though you can barely carry all you have, you're like, ooh, one more store, having a sale, gotta go. I mean, the eyes of man are never satisfied. So we have to like realize we could have a very real problem with greed. 
So we really do need to listen to Jesus's words. So and we'll finally get to the answer. How can we practically do what Jesus wants us to do? Well, let's use the story itself. Let's go back to the rich man. What did the rich man do? He asked a question. What should I do with all my stuff? And clearly got the answer wrong. So I'm gonna give you two answers for a total of four words, if y'all can remember four words, two answers that I think will help us get a better answer. These two answers go together. And the first one is this. When we look around and ask the question, what should I do with all my stuff? Say no. We're gonna start with say no. We're gonna say no to some things we want. We're gonna say no to some things we could get. We're simply going to say no because we are trying to guard against greed getting into our hearts. You see, the truth is, for most of us, if we can afford it, we get it. I mean, has anyone ever said, honey, would you like to go out to dinner? Sure. Is there money in the budget? Sure. No. <laughs> I mean, no, no, we say there's money in the budget. Okay, yeah, let's go out to eat. We, we just get whatever we want. Let, let, me, let me just kind of give you some perspective. I grew up in a generation, I'm about to age myself. We're gonna find out who's with me. How many people in here know what Atari is? Atari, okay, there we go. We just got, got some people with me. All right, here's the thing. If you did not raise your hand, Atari is like PlayStation or Xbox 40 years ago. That's what it was, okay? And even before that, this will shock you for those that are young, but even before that, you had to actually go to that place, I called a mall, and you had to go into a certain room in the mall called an arcade. You had to beg your mama for a bunch of quarters and you had to play video games there. And so at some point, years and years, decades ago, somebody came up with an idea. <gasps> what if we made a machine where kids could play video games? at home, like they could play them all day long. That would be like crazy. And so Atari was born. And all of my friends had Atari. Every cool kid had an Atari. I did not have an Atari. And I didn't have an Atari because as much of my life growing up that I can remember, my dad worked two jobs and sometimes three. And he did that so that we had a pretty good living. I never went hungry. I had clothes, but a video game console, no. That was a luxury, that kind of thing never happened. And so here's what happened. Life said no to some things that I wanted. My wife, she grew up in a communist nation. Her greatest hope many days was food. We didn't even care what it was, just let today be a day with food. Life said no to many things she wanted. And then she married me, a missionary turned middle school, high school teacher turned pastor. Life said no to a whole lot we wanted. That's just how that works, right? And, and all of you probably have a story and you remember, maybe for you it was when you were in college and you were eating ramen and that's all you could afford was just ramen. And sometimes you couldn't even afford the electricity to like cook in a microwave. And so you, you chewed on that little block from one class to the other walking across campus, right? And so we've all had those stories and now suddenly, finally, life says, yeah. We actually have the money, so we do what we want. We live well, we indulge, we go out, we get whatever we want, and we never stop to ask, what might this be doing to my heart? You see, just because we can, does it still mean we should? I'm not calling stuff bad. We'll talk about that in a minute. I'm just talking about the condition of our heart. Do we ever ask that question? Well, I, I want this. The money's in the budget. Let's go to the mall. Do we ever stop and say, but is it good for my heart to have it? And if I could, I'm gonna even pick on some of us because some of us, well, the truth is we don't even have that money. Some of us, we get everything we want because we have good friends called Visa and MasterCard and they just help take us everywhere we wanna go. It's just because we want it, so we're gonna get it anyway. I'm gonna tell you a little story. When uh, my wife and I were first married and uh, didn't have kids, and so we, we, would, uh, we were just stupid, to be honest, financially, and, and so we would do some things like uh, sit around on a Saturday, look at each other bored and just go, what do you want to do today? I don't know. What do you want to do today? I don't know. Why don't we just go to the mall and walk around? And, and we lived in another state and the mall was actually an hour and a half away. It was a really cool mall. So it was a lot of fun to walk around. But how many of y'all know if you walk and look long enough, you will eventually buy? Especially when they've got really good sale signs and Visa says, I'll help. And, and so we would come home spending a couple of hundred dollars on clothes we didn't have. And, we, you know, I mean, after a hard day of shopping, that is a, that's hard work, gentlemen, right? 
you know, I mean, it, it, you got to like get a steak dinner on the way home. So we'd always stop and Visa would give us some steak and some of those honey rolls, that stuff, you know, butter and things. That you, yeah, come on, y'all. It was just a week of prayer and fasting. Y'all can go have you a honey roll today. One of the times we went, my wife and I went to put some stuff at the register and tried to buy it. And can you believe that that clerk looked at us and said, Visa is not your friend anymore. They have abandoned you. Turns out we had maxed out the credit card because, oh, whenever we got bored, we would just go to that mall and walk around. Not buying much, of course. We thought, well, that's, that's, that's depressing. Sad and dejected, we decided we'd at least go to the food court and have like a cookie and a soda because, I mean, <laughs> we're definitely not getting steak and we're kind of disappointed. And do you know Visa? Man, what a bad friend. It could not even get us a cookie and a soda. It's a true story, by the way. So very dejected and frustrated, we got in our car and we started to drive our hour and a half back home. And about an hour home, we realized, like, we haven't eaten all day. We have not anything to drink. We're thirsty. We're hangry. We're in a bad mood. And we think, let's go to a gas station. We'll, we'll figure out how to get some soda. So my wife and I, we pull into a gas station, and each of us gets out of the car, and we get down on our knees in the parking lot, knees on the concrete in the gas station parking lot. And I know you think I'm about to tell you an amazing prayer testimony. No. We weren't on our knees to pray. We were on our knees to look under the seats to find enough coins to pay for a Dr. Pepper. And we couldn't even find enough coins to pay for a Dr. Pepper. So we had to turn around and finish driving all the way home with absolutely nothing. Listen, we could have not labeled it correctly at the time. And I'm embarrassed to admit it today, but we had a greed problem. And I share our story with you because I know we're not alone. And let me just tell you, if you are having to go into debt to borrow money for something you want and you think you've got to have, can I encourage you? That means you got a greed problem. Not pointing fingers, been there, done that. And if greed has gripped your heart, can I plead with you? Surrender. Fly the white flag. Say, I'm done. I, I need out of this. And the truth is, if you are, are headed down that road, if you are struggling with a budget, if you're not sure to handle some finances, whether you are a little bit in trouble or a whole lot in trouble, one of the things that we're doing with this series to really help you uh, get some true financial freedom and, and worry a whole lot less is as soon as this series is done, when we start all of our new life groups, we're gonna have multiple groups called Financial Peace University. It's Dave Ramsey's material. And if you've never taken it, really wanna encourage you to do that. I'll talk more about it all throughout the series. Uh, but you know, if, if you're in a situation like we were, you're gonna need some help. It's, it's gonna need some advice and some, some wisdom from some other folks. I wanna encourage you to put that on your radar to think about joining a financial peace group. But now let's move back to those of us who said, Jimmy, I don't need to hear all that. I got the money, I buy what I want. I can afford it, okay. But we still have to ask the question, should we? Is it good for our heart? Let me tell you a little secret about God. He loves you. He loves you more than you'll ever know. I mean, I can stand up here and I can preach some things about how much he loves you, like the fact that he sent his son to die for you. I mean, We'll never fully grasp that as long as we're this side of heaven. But his love is still demonstrated in some very practical things in everyday life. Let me give you an illustration. I have four children right now. Three of them are younger, two are teens, and one of them is a tween, if that's, is that the correct word? Is that what we call those people? And, and as our two oldest are going into high school, our kids are weird in everybody else's eyes because our kids don't have phones. And everybody's like, what's up? They try to, hey, my friend wants to text me. They don't have a number. It's the weirdest thing because they'll give them their mom's number and my wife gets these weirds. Anyway, it's just crazy. And now that they're going to high school and they're going different directions, we're like, should we get phones? And so we're having this conversation about getting phones and here's the deal. The reason we haven't given them phones is not because we can't afford it. See, the reason we have not given them phones up until this point, the reason we've said no up until this point is because I used to be a middle school and high school teacher and a youth pastor. 
And I understand that in your teenage years, a lot of stuff comes into your soul that it's very hard to get rid of. And in this generation, much of that comes through a phone. And so I have said no to something my children have wanted because I love them. You see, the same thing happens with God. If we're not going to say no to ourselves for ourselves, then God may have to say no to us, for us, because he loves us. And the craziest part of it all is we are praying to God every day for that thing. God, I need that new car. God, I want that job with that big raise. God, would you do this? God, would you do that? And then we're mad at God when he won't give it to us. God, why won't you bless me? And he's looking at you going, I am blessing you to the greatest extent I can. I am keeping your heart safe because above all else, guard your heart. I know you want that thing, but I promise you, it's not gonna be good for your heart if you get it. You see, the point of what Jesus was saying, guard against every kind of greed, the question for us has to change. It is no longer just, can I afford it? Do I want it? The question we have to start to ask is, what is this going to do to my heart? And so we have to begin at times to simply say no, because no is the right answer to protect our hearts. And I'm just gonna pause right here and make sure I, I, I give a very important disclaimer. There is no formula for this. I am not preaching against material possessions or nice meals. If I get the chance to take a nice vacation, I do it. If I get to go to a nice steak dinner, I enjoy every moment and praise Jesus for taste buds. I can't stand here today and tell you what brand of clothes you can or cannot wear, what brand of car you can or cannot drive. I, I can't tell you the, the amount that you're supposed to enjoy and give the rest of I can't do any of that. And that's not my job. You see, you may have heard the phrase, it's okay to have stuff as long as stuff doesn't have you. Well, that's the whole point. I can't tell you what brand of stuff has you? I can't tell you how much stuff has you. Let me tell you the absolute truth. I have friends with a whole, whole lot, but the lot doesn't have them. And I have friends with very, very little. And that little has gripped their, tight, their heart so tight they just can't function. Matter of fact, I wanna tell you in my own experience, the poorer I was, the greedier I was. Because the poorer you are, the less you have, the more that you actually think getting stuff will make you happy. So I'm not gonna stand here today and tell you, those of you with a lot of stuff and fancy cars, y'all the center, no. That's, that's not what I read in this story. Matter of fact, can I point out something about this story? Jesus never criticized that man for being rich, just for being greedy. So let me tell you the solution is the Holy Spirit is the one that you take shopping. The Holy Spirit's the one that can say, sure, you can have that, enjoy it. After all, God gave you life to enjoy and he gave you some money. One of the reasons God gives us money is to enjoy this life. There is absolutely nothing wrong with that, as long as the enjoyment doesn't have you. But the Holy Spirit's also the one that can say, yeah, you can have that. That one, now, that might get into your heart. Let's say no. So what are we gonna do to protect our hearts against greed? We're gonna say no, and the second one is give more. We're gonna say no and we're gonna give more. See, there is a very simple truth. If we buy everything we want and we enjoy all of that stuff, it can have an effect on our heart. It's a condition called greed. But if we give lots of stuff and we see the difference it can make, that can also have a condition on our heart. It's called generosity. It can mess you up for life in a really good way. The truth is Jesus talked so much about giving. We're gonna follow up later in the series with that point. And I'm gonna go ahead and wrap us up for today. We're gonna say no and give more. Jesus told us to guard against every kind of greed. And the answer is to say no and give more. We are going to say no to something we can buy just to protect our hearts. We're gonna to give to someone we can bless just to protect our hearts. We're gonna say no, and we're gonna give more. 
And I'm gonna close with the last sentence of Jesus' story. I actually didn't read the last sentence. We left off with him saying, you fool, you will die this very night. Then who will get everything you work for? This is how it will be with whoever stores up things for themselves but is not rich toward God. This is how it will be for whoever stores up things for himself. See, here's the reality Jesus is trying to help us see. If you turn life into getting stuff, if you believe that happiness and success is about having lots of stuff, life ends with a bitter disappointment. If you want to avoid that, you're going to have to answer the question differently than this man in the story. He said, what should I do? Store it for myself. I recommend that we get a different answer today. When you look at your life and you ask, what should I do? We're going to say no. We're going to give more. Amen? Let me pray for us. God, today we come and tell you we truly need your help because you have blessed us and we thank you for your blessings. The truth is we live in the richest era in all of human history upon the earth. And the truth is most every one of us here today, well, we also live in the richest country, at least one of them that the earth has ever seen. And so for that, our normal lives are like the lives of kings in the past. God, we are so blessed. We have access to so much stuff. And so God, we just come before you and confess, we will need your help to do this. So God, will you come and protect our hearts? Will you give us strength to say no just because we need to? Will you help us to give? Will you help, help us do what we can't do for ourselves? And that is to guard against every kind of greed. We can't do it alone. Holy Spirit, would you guide us? We thank you. You just stay in a place of prayer. I'd like to speak to those of you that have yet to make Jesus your king. We talked about how much God loves you by rescuing you. He sent his son to die on the cross so that his death would pay for your sins and make you right with God so that his resurrected life would give you eternal life. We call it the free gift of salvation. But the thing is that every one of us has to receive that gift at some time. And if you've never done that, I hope for you it's right now. All you have to do is pray something like this to yourself and to God. Lord Jesus, I thank you that you died for me. And so now, I choose to live for you. I thank you that you love me. I thank you that I'm forgiven. In my simple prayer today, would you fill me with your spirit? Would you give me a life of great meaning in your kingdom? Amen. Would you all help me celebrate with them? Amen.